Good, good afternoon, church. Uh, welcome to our 5 p.m. service. Happy to be in the house of the Lord with you. Let me just read to you a passage of scripture. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Shall we stand on our feet? Psalms 34 verse 3 says, Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. And that's really what we are here to do today. And let's just prepare our hearts as we open this time in a word of prayer. And may the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father and the presence of the Holy Spirit be magnified in our midst today. Father, we just come before you and thank you for another week that your grace has sustained us. And so, Lord, we want to come to worship you. We want to come, oh God, and give you all the glory and all the honour, trusting, oh God, that your strength, your grace is sufficient for us. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us today and we give you all the glory and we magnify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen, Amen. Come, let's just say the Apostles' Creed together before we have a time we we'll hand to the worship team. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand today. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So happy to see so many of you today. My heart. 
close our eyes and lift up our hearts to the Lord today. Apostle John wrote, But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. On this Father's Day weekend, we honour you, Abba Father. May our worship be like a sweet aroma that rises to your throne. Running out 
surrender ourselves to you today for we know that you are good you are kind you are gracious and compassionate towards us God you are our Abba Father you call us your own your mercies are new every morning you paint the morning skies just for us. You heal our broken hearts and bottle up every tear. And you turn our ashes into beauty. Father, you love and accept us just as we are. And when you chastise us, it is always with love and not condemnation. Your love forgives. Your love redeems and restores. You make known to us the path of life. And in your presence, God, there is fullness of joy. Oh, how great how great is your love for us. Oh, we love you, Lord. We say we love you, Lord. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, we love you, Lord. With all our hearts, we love you, Lord. There is no one else, no one else like you. There is no one else that we can find no one else like you. Hey, hey, there is none, there is none like you, Jesus. No one else can touch my heart like you. I can search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. Sing it again. There is none. for all it's 
There's a verse in the Bible in Psalms 20 that says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So, church, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of our God of Jacob defend you and send you help from his sanctuary. Truly, there is none like Yahweh. There's none like the Lord our God who watches over His people. The God of Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. And even today as we come before Him, and commit all your cares, your trust, your worries unto, unto the Lord because God cares for us and He knows where His people are. His eyes are on us. We are the apple of His eye. Father, we thank you, Lord, that our trust is not in anything else or anyone else. But Lord, we lift up our eyes to the hills. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from you, Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And I just pray today, Lord, for our church as we worship you and we sing of the goodness of the God and declare that there is none like you. Truly, O oh God, show yourself strong on behalf of your people. Lord, answer us in the day of trouble hear our cry and hear our prayers. And I just pray, O oh Lord, that today continue to minister to us and move by the power of your Holy Spirit to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring peace into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise today. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Please be seated down. Thank you, singers, musicians. Thank you for leading us today in worship. Yeah, every, every week when we come before the Lord to, uh, to sing, yeah, you know, it, our worship is our prayer. Our worship is also a time uh, we adore the Lord, we trust in Him, and we, we cast all our cares and our burdens on Him. Amen. 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 Well, I have a few. Uh, I, I will be the one doing all the announcements today. I have a few things to just uh, let everyone know. First of all, of course, uh, again, just to let you know that if you are new in our church, uh, we have this welcome welcomers card that we can uh, we 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 have for for those of you who uh, want to know us a little bit or connect with us. You, you can either scan the QR code outside the hall. There is also a poster, an A1 size poster, and you can scan that QR code as well. Okay, if you brought a friend, you can also take the card for your friend. Basically, inside yeah, there are information on our church, our website. Our YouTube channel where you can listen to the past messages. Um, next two, uh, two weeks' time, we are going to have our churchwide Bible study. Um, I think we have made this announcement many times, so I just uh, just let everyone know that um, we are asking for registration only so that we can cater some finger food before the session, and we will be using the praise hall instead of the Thanksgiving hall. Uh, reason is for for the uh, recording, the audio. Uh, we are much more familiar with the praise hall than the Thanksgiving hall, so. Um, I think using back what we are familiar with in the Chinese church hall will be the best. All right. And then next week, we have, uh, I've invited a guest speaker to come. She is Irene Ong. Um, she has a, she is a professional counsellor. And let me just give you a bit of a background of what we are trying to do as a church. Now, on the 14th of September, so in a few months' time, this hall we will not be able to use so usually when we do, are not able to use the hall we we will move to singapore christian canaan church but for that weekend we have decided uh, to organize seminars and we'll be using the singapore yacht club um, and we have three rooms and we are going to have an afternoon of seminar and then we'll end the night saturday night with a church where we can eat together for dinner at the place so the main focus for the seminar will be on uh, mental health, mental wellness, on marriage, and on parenting. So the reason for the three rooms and different sessions is so that we can all attend. If you want to, you can attend the parenting, then later the next session, attend marriage, and the next session, attend mental wellness. So Irene Ong will be one of the speakers for that 14th of September. So I'm asking her to come 
uh, to introduce herself to the church for us to get to know her and so that on the 14th of September when we see her, uh, at least we are not um, strangers. Okay, So I'm just going to ask her to come and share uh, something general on mental wellness. So that will be next week. Then, week after that, on the 29th of June, I have uh, Dr. David Wong who is going to come and share. I know Pastor David from Singapore Bible College. Uh, I spend one whole year, once a month with him. He is like my mentor, uh, like a discipleship group that we have once a month. And he has many, many, many years of uh, pastoral experience. Been to, uh, went to Hawaii and did a Bible institute there called Haggai, a Bible training institute. He was the, um, like, he was like the principal of the school. He was running it. Uh, he was a pastor in a, in a Bible Presbyterian Church in Singapore, came back, continued pastoring. So, Pastor David is considered a pastor of pastors. Okay? So, he, so I, I'm very happy that he's, he, he's here. And I think some of you have attended one of his sessions at Singapore Bible College uh, where he taught about um, succession planning, passing the baton or finishing well. Okay, so he has written many books. When he comes that weekend, he already told me he wants to talk about breakfast with Jesus. Okay, and it will be, uh, if I'm not wrong, it should be a passage from John. So he's going to bring along his new book. Uh, it's also titled Breakfast with Jesus, and he will be making that book available for sale. So that will be the end of this month. All right, so just to let you know that these next two weeks, we are going to have guest speakers. Because today we are going to be the last session of the book of Isaiah, the two weeks break will give me opportunity to read, to study, and to prepare for our next series of uh, book that we're going to study. And most likely at this present time, I'm thinking of doing the book of Ephesians. So usually in our church, we do Old Testament, then we will do a New Testament book, and, in, and then at the end of the year, we will uh, do a, a gospel. I think this year... Um, if God willing, we will do the Gospel of John. Because we have, been, we have done Matthew, we have done Mark, we have done Luke, and so this year we will do John. So we'll just keep rotating, and over a course of time, we will be able to cover um, all the books of the Bible. Okay? All right? Now, uh, community engagement, uh, two weeks' time on the 29th of June, we... Uh, we need 10 volunteers for each session. There are two sessions, one on the 29th of June, one on the 13th of July. So let's just focus on the 29th of June first. Uh, we are asking for 10 volunteers from our church to do a community engagement uh, program with uh, a Bado residential committee. Okay, so we have, these are the residential committee in this area where we are building a long-term relationship with them uh, so that we can continue to reach out to the uh, residents who are staying in, 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 in those rented flats or one to two room flats so that we can, you know, during Easter, during Christmas, uh, sometimes Chinese New Year, we will do our outreach, sort of like giving them goodie bags and so on. So this time around, the RC has asked us for, for help. So we're just going to go there and engage with the residents. It's just a one hour commitment from 3 to 4 p.m. on the 29th of June. So there's a QR code, uh, you can scan it. After today's service, I will, I will send this slide into our WhatsApp group chat so you can sign up as well. Okay? Then, uh, Brother Danny, he will then contact you and give you more details concerning this community outreach. Last but not least, uh, is our family time. I just want to congratulate uh, Lubin and Crystal uh, for their newborn baby girl, Caitlin Tan Rui Ying. Yeah. And... Crystal is John and May's daughter. So John and May, again, they have, they're already grandparents, but now they have an added granddaughter. So let's give John and May a big hand as well. We rejoice with you. We're just very happy that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not there yet. I only have children. I'm not. But one day, one day, okay? By the grace of God. Okay, so that's, that's all the announcements I have. And so we collect the offering. Then I've asked Augustine to come and read. Uh, for us today's scripture reading. And let's just give generously and give with a cheerful heart. Okay, and at the back of the hall, there are two white boxes and you can drop your offerings if you are giving by cash. Father, we thank you for this uh, time that we can rejoice um, with those, Lord, who are rejoicing. We rejoice with Lubin, 
Crystal, with John and May. We thank you, O oh God, for your goodness to our church and goodness to our family. And now we want to give you, O oh Lord, out of the abundance of the blessing you have given to us, we want to worship you with our giving. Bless every cheerful giver that gives. Let them rejoice, O oh God, in this act of worship. And continue, O oh Lord, to use these funds for the extension of your work and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we come to the last uh, session on the book of Isaiah. I counted, we had 16 sermons from January until now, June. Uh, of course, in between, we had different guest speakers, but about 16 messages on the book of Isaiah. And I'm very glad that we are able to come to the last one. We will be, uh, the title, of course, will have to be the most, the climax, the new heavens and new earth. Okay, so it will be Isaiah chapter 65 to 66, and the scripture reading will be from verses 17 to, what is that? 17 to 25. Okay, Augustine, will you please come? Yeah, thank you. Today's reading from Isaiah chapter 25, uh, chapter 65. Verse 17 to 25. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and thus shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Amen. 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 Now, church, when we read of this phrase, the new heavens and new earth, it's very easy for us to immediately think of heaven, like in the future, at the resurrection. But today, I want to show you that the new heaven and new earth in the context of Isaiah, is really referring to how God is going to bring His people back from Babylon and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? The restoration of the land, the peoples, and I will show you from the word later on, and you will begin to see there is a very beautiful picture of God's restoration. Now, let's do a bit of a quick recap. We have covered... So far, this uh, chiasm, and I think we have covered all the way from A to C prime. Now we are the last part, which is the B and a, B prime and A prime. We are going to see how God began in Isaiah chapter 56, talking about how the doors are open to the Gentiles. And so today, at the conclusion, we are going to see how the Gentiles, God's glory will be known to the Gentiles. 
As we look at chapter 65 and 66, you, um, if you had taken time to read, I think we, I, I told the staff to let everyone know that we're going to look, look at these two chapters. I took a long time to come to this next picture, which you also have that in your PDF, so we can just show this. I want you to see that chapters 65 and 66, if you can imagine it to be like a mountain, think of it like a mountain, okay? Chapter 65 from verses 1 is like the ascending to the mountain top. What is the mountain top? The new heaven and new earth. And then chapter 66 is the other side of the mountain. So that verse 1 of chapter 65 corresponds with the last verse of chapter 66. Do you, do you see the mirror image? And if you can understand it this way, you'll find that there's many similarities between verses in 65 and verses in 66. Such as, if you look at what is right closest to the new heaven and new earth, imagine it to be Jerusalem on the mountain top. You will see on the left and right, joys for the servants of the Lord. The passages will be surrounding God's promise and His blessing for His servants. But along the way, there will be some sort of a, a, a filtering, a segregation of those who are worshippers of idols and pagan practices and those who are truly the servants of God. So that is the ascending part. And later, you're going to see in my sermon, I will show you that there are two paths, two choices that we make. And then finally, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 to 24 is a conclusion of the whole part of Isaiah, the third part. Okay, what do, what do, I, what do I mean by that? That means I shared with you from Isaiah chapter 1 all the way to chapter 66. And I told you that the book of Isaiah can be broken up into three big portions. Chapter 1 to 39 is the first book. Chapter 40 to 55, the second book. And the third part, 56 to 66, as the third book. And you will find that these last three verses, Isaiah 66, verse 22 to 24, are like the book ends of the third book, which corresponds very well with Isaiah 56, verses 1 to 8 which you are going to see later on. So I'm just giving you a heads up so that you know where I'm headed and you will begin to understand it uh, when the whole message is presented. So this is how I will break down today's message. I will share with you, first of all, focusing on the mountaintop, the new heavens and new earth. When we use the word heavens, new heavens, I don't want you to think that, oh, immediately you're going to think three heavens. Heaven, you know, because Paul was taken up to the third heaven. In the Hebrew, uh, heavens has no singular. Just like the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. You don't read in the Bible, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the water. It's never singular, it's waters. So similarly, when it comes to the heavens, it's always plural. But you should think of it as just the sky, okay? A new heaven, a new earth. Now that is... Imagine it's like Jesus saying in the gospel, I will build my church as a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. So we know that the new Jerusalem or the new heaven and new earth, which is basically a picture of the new Jerusalem, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, the New Testament author interprets Isaiah 65 as referring to the church because I saw a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven who is the bride of Christ, which is the church of God. Okay, so I will just focus on that first and then I'll go to part B, which is I'll talk about the destiny of the believing and the unbelieving Israel. That means the ascending up, chapter 65, you will see two groups of people. Then as we descend down, I will let you see who will be living in the new Jerusalem. God's emphasis and description of His servants, who are His people. Then we will end, in the end of chapter 66, with the nations 
seeing the glory of God. And we'll have the conclusion. So let's go to part A, the new heavens and the new earth. He says in verse 17, which is what Augustine just read for us, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. And what does he say? For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. So do you see that the new heavens and new earth is really referring to Jerusalem. I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. So what is the context? The context is because they have been taken into exile. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was burned. So now God is going to bring them back and God is going to recreate or rebuild Jerusalem again. He says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress because of the war. The war, the Babylonian invasion was the, was the distress and the cry. So God is saying there will be no more walls. Okay, so that's the prophecy, that's the idea. So Jerusalem being, if you know Mount Zion or Jerusalem, is being on a mountain top. So that is the holy mountain of God. It's where the temple is situated. It is the dwelling place of God with His people because of the temple. Now, then let's look at verse, verses 20 to 21. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill up his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now, over here you see that there are infants. So it means... And there are people who, in a sense, will still die, okay? But let me just explain to you that it is trying to say that because there's no war, like, unlike in the past, so now is a place of blessing and prosperity and peace where people will live to a ripe old age instead of war and destruction cutting short their life. So then there's this phrase, you know, it says, and the sinner who is a hundred years old shall be accursed. And this is where it traps most people because when you read it, you can't really, you can't really f make sense because if you think about this is heaven and this is the resurrection life, then how could there be still sinners? You know what I mean? Now, if you look, look at other Bible translations, which, is also, which also makes sense because the word sinner there, which you, if, you, if you know the, old, the New Testament, you know that the word a sinner or sin means missing the mark. So when you look at some other translation, it actually says that what it actually means instead of translating English into sinner, they translate as, and a person who does not live to a hundred years old. That means he missed the mark of a hundred shall be considered a curse. You follow? Missed the mark. Okay. Now, so... Therefore, my point here is to just let you know that instead of thinking of this passage as talking about resurrection life in the future, look at it as a picture of new creation. Something like returning back to the Garden of Eden, returning back to God's original intent for mankind before the fall of man. So that is like the picture of restoration, bringing you back to the beginning. So let's look at verse 22 to 23. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. So you see that there's, there's still language of bearing children. It's also one of the reasons why I do not think that this passage is talking about the future because if you know the New Testament, Jesus says, in eternity, there will be no more marrying and giving into marriage. There will be no more about bearing children. But here, he says that you will not labor in vain and you will not bear children for calamity. So he's, he's trying to say they will bear children, they will enjoy God's blessings of peace and prosperity and life will be great as opposed to before the, the Babylonian invasion where there was calamity and there was war and there was destruction. Now, then let's look at verse 24 to 25. 
And this is where I highlight and underline it because I want you to pay attention and remember this verse. He says, Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. So God is saying to those who are my people who are dwelling in this new Jerusalem that I will, the new heaven and new earth that I will bring them to, I promise them that I will be with them such that before they call, I will answer. And when they, bef- when they are yet speaking, I will already hear. This, later on, you're going to see, is in direct contrast and opposite to those who are disobedient to God. Because God says, I call, but they did not answer. Then verse 25 is what I mean by a restoration back to Eden. Because you see, it says, The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains. So this is a picture of bliss, shalom, where there is no destruction. This is the beginning. Is where after God created the world in six days, on the sixth day, He said, it is very good. Everything is perfect. There is no war, violence, no destruction before the fall of man. Right? So this is like a restoration. To the point that, to the point that, the wolf and the lamb grazing together is like a transformation of their nature. Yeah? So, think about how this applies to us. If we had no understanding of the word and there was no guidance from the, and, the, and the impact of, or, or the change, the transformation that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, maybe we, are, we would have returned evil for evil. We would have You know, we continue to bear resentment, unforgiveness. But through the Word of God and through transformation, instead of returning evil for evil, we learn to overcome evil with good. We learn to manage our temper, our anger. We become generous and kind where we used to be stingy. Now we used to, we would rather be humble than to be proud. We are a giver and not a hoarder. Like there's a transformation in our nature. But where does that come from? It comes from the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit transforming us day by day. So this is like a picture of that transformation that comes when we are God's people living in this new Jerusalem. So now as we understand this mountaintop, let's look at the journey up this mountaintop. The destiny of the believing and the unbelieving Israel in Je- in Isaiah 65, verses 1 to 16. So like a fork road, to get there, we need to make choices. On the way there, there are things that the Lord would tell us that He's displeased with. This is not what He wants. And there are things that God says, this is pleasing to me. But we make a choice. Do we want to obey Him or not? So let's look at the rebellious first, okay? Let's look at what they are doing. In verses 2 to 7, it says, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks. They are sacrificing, but they are sacrificing in the... They sit in tombs. You know that in Israel, I mean, in the Old Testament, when you touch a corpse, a dead body, you are unclean. So when you live among tombs, you are very unclean. And then it says, and spend the night in secret places, and they eat pig's flesh. You know, I mean, we, we may not have a lot of Jewish friends, but at least we know some Malay friends that we have. We know that they don't, take, they don't eat pork. So this is like you are directly coming against the laws of God. You are provoking Him. You are intentionally being rebellious. You know these are the things that God displeases, but you are doing them. You you understand? And it says, and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels. So this is a clear, outright rebellious act of the people. So what does God say then? Let's look at verse 5 to 7. They they say this, this is what they say, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. And they even think that they are holy, okay? So, 
God says, these are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. So it's like always provoking him to his face. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. Because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. I told you that Jerusalem is also on a mountain. Instead of choosing the Mount Zion, the mountain where the temple of the Lord is, they chose another mountain to sacrifice. So they make that choice. This will be their destiny, the Bible says, okay? Isaiah 65 verse 11 to 12 says, But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune and fill cups of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you to the sword and all of you shall bow down to the slaughter. Because, now this is where I told you the contrast. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen. But you did what was evil in my eyes and chose what I did not delight in. Earlier on, remember, in the New Jerusalem, God says, before they call, I will already answer. But now, God is saying, look, Look, my people, do you see that I'm constantly reaching out to you? I'm calling you, but you're not listening. But when it comes to your relationship with me, before you call, I will already answer you. So there is this big contrast that we see here. So what were they doing? What were they trying to sacrifice to? The Bible says they are seeking fortune and destiny. It's a bit like divination or fortune-telling. They are seeking after other powers, other gods, to save them maybe, to protect them maybe, and forsaking Yahweh, the God of Israel. Then you say, but what's the, what's, what's the big deal? Okay, so let's just look from the beginning. That God chose Israel, not because Israel was powerful, they are strong, they were a very small tribe. He said, I chose you because I want you to be a model, a kind of a, a light, a light to the nations. A nation that I call you my people and you call me your God and we have this covenantal relationship and you live by a certain way so that the nations of the earth will know me through you. So when you start to do these things like call on destiny and call on fortune and do fortune-telling divination, sacrifice your children, eat, eat unclean food, do all kinds of pagan practices, how are the nations going to know God? They have, they have kind of run contrary or done things counter what God's original intent was. So do you see that this was one path, okay, one path. But there's another path, another group of people who chose to be God's servants. Then this is where you see the joys for being the Lord's servant. Therefore, in verse 13 and 14, it says, The Lord, Behold, my servants shall eat. My servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Do you see the contrast? Behold, my servants shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart and shall wail for breaking of spirit. What do you think about being a servant. You know, in my house, I, I have dogs. And in the New Testament, there is a passage in the Gospel where there was this Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was demon-possessed. She came and she cried out to Jesus, please save my daughter. And Jesus says, it's not good for me to take the bread for the children and give it dogs. And the woman said, even the dogs will eat the crumbs under the table. And Jesus turned to her and said, I have not seen greater faith. You know, when I say my dogs, right, I also have helpers at home. What is the good thing about being a helper or being a servant or even being a dog? Is that I don't see my dog working very hard so that he can earn his food. The beauty of the dog and the helper is that they have a master. And do you know that no matter what the dog does, right, his pee-pee and his poo, right? I know Esther will, will know this because Esther and James have dogs and they love dogs. The master is the one that cleans up their poo. 
So, even for our helpers at home, they know that because there's a master, the master cares for them. The important thing is, don't be a stray dog. It's okay to be a dog as long as you have a master, but don't be a stray dog. It's better to be a servant in the house of God, in the New Jerusalem, than to be outside where you have no master that watches over you, that protects you, that cares for you. So there is joy. God says, My servant shall eat, my servant shall drink, and my servant shall rejoice. That is the joy of being part of God's people. So who will be in this new Jerusalem as we now descend down into chapter 66? If you look at chapter 66, verses 1 to 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now, God's eyes are not on big edifices like buildings, skyscrapers. If you can show the slide. Since the Tower of Babel, since that time, mankind, right, has always been, it's, it's called one-upmanship. I want to do better than you. So the building that I have in my nation must be taller than yours. Man has always been trying to build taller and taller and bigger and bigger and more impressive. It's almost like I want to impress the gods, like from the time of the Tower of Babel, right? I want to impress the nations. I want to impress everyone. But God says, I'm not so impressed by all the edifices. My eyes are not fixed on things. My eyes are on the one that is humble, contrite, and broken. So, the reflection is this. What is true humility? What is true humility, right? The next slide. Knowing that God's eyes are not on impressive things, things like buildings but on the humble and the contrite in heart and the one who trembles at his word how will you and I change or how can we change the way we live I think you know, in our life right we never think we, we never set a goal that the goal of my life is to be humble we set a goal usually I want to achieve this by this certain age I want to be able to do that if in my company, I hope I can be in that position or maybe I can get that kind of a salary. It's always achievement, things. But very seldom do we think about what does God really look for in us? He's looking for one who trembles at His word, who cares enough, who believes it, who allows the word to shape his mind and his thinking and the way he lives his life. Maybe that is true humility. Come, let's just continue. So then we come now to part D, which is God's glory among the nations. So as we now go back again, I told you chapter 65, verse 1, he's talking about God opening the doors to the nations. And now we see at the end of chapter 66, again the nations are mentioned. In verses 18 to 19, we see here it says, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations. You see it again? The nations. To Tashish, to Pul, to Lut, who draw the bow, to Tubal, to Javan, or Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Okay, so very interestingly, you see verse 19, just keep the verses up there. I will set a sign among them. Isaiah did not say, what is this sign? Verse 19, right, the beginning part, I will set a sign among them. He didn't say what is a sign. But if we read the verse before that, it says, 
they shall come and they shall see my glory. So this sign should be related to the glory of God. Now in the New Testament, from the New Testament author's perspective, I don't think there's anything else that really reflects the glory of God more than the cross and the death of Jesus Christ and His resurrection. All, almost all the New Testament authors refer to that as the mystery, the revealing of the glory of God in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right? And then, very interestingly, I want to share with you, which is true because it's, it's because of that sign, because of the Savior and His death and His resurrection, that's why the nations have come to see God and to know God. That's why you and I are Christians, okay? Now, if you look at the names of these places that are being mentioned, Tashish, Pul, Lut, and so on and so forth, I have done some reading, okay? So, because of some textual um, variant, so sometimes you cannot really make out what is actually that place. But more or less, Tashish, more or less, is Spain, talking about Spain. So if you know the book of Romans, Paul is writing to the Romans to say that, hey, I'm going to Spain. Can you support my ministry? So when I understand that and when I read Isaiah, I begin to see that Isaiah seems to be like a roadmap for the ministry of the apostles in the New Testament. Because why would they want to go to Spain? Why would Paul want to go to Spain? Like, so it's, to me, it's fascinating. Now, then what about Paul, Lud, and all these places? Okay, first of all, Javan or Javan or Javan is actually Greece. That one is quite firm. Most scholars believe that's Greece. And you know in the New Testament, Paul went to Greece. Okay, but what about the other places, okay? These names, okay, actually if you go back to Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10, you know that Noah has three boys, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is where um, the, the Hebrew people come from. The Jews, right? Uh, I mean the descendants of Abraham came from Shem, Shem. So these other places are the descendants of Ham and Japheth. So it's very beautiful that God chose Shem and then he rescues these people to be himself. And now he says, I will send you to go out and gather your brothers from the nations meaning the descendants of Ham and Japheth. And all will now come to Jerusalem to worship me. Which is the restoration. Genesis chapter 10 is the dispersion of the nations and the, now the regathering of all nations to God. So now I want to read to you the conclusion which ties in very well with, I told you, Isaiah chapter 56. If you look at the conclusion, this is what he says. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon, meaning month to month, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, meaning week to week, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. This is a very beautiful picture, isn't it, of what the gospel is. To go into all the world, Jesus says, I sent you now, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations to come and worship God. But you see, the interesting thing is this. In, Je in John chapter 4, there was this conversation about do we worship in this mountain or that mountain? Our ancestors say we should worship in Jerusalem. But no, no, no. Jesus says, no, no, no. In the last days, right, the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So it is no longer about a physical location called Jerusalem, but that everyone all over the world, in every month and every week, you will all come and worship me because of what my Son, Jesus Christ, has done for you. Isn't this amazing? Isaiah. No. Then he says this, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, which I told you earlier on, right? God says the judgment will be upon them. 
For their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So this in reading in context is God's judgment, the separation of the, the goats and the sheep, right? The separation of those who are truly his servants and those who rebel against him, pagan worship, pagan idolatry, etc. And they will be judged. So why do I say that this ties in nicely to form the inclusio? Inclusio are like bookends. You know what bookends? You want all your book to stand up, right? You put one, something to block here, and you put something to block there. They are like the covers of a book. So from 56 to 66. Just to show you some verses in chapter 56, verses 1 to 8. Just some, okay? Quickly. You will see verse 2 mentions... Uh, Sabbath. Verse 3 says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me. If you look at verse 4, it talks about the eunuch and Sabbath again. If you look at verse 6, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord and everyone who keeps the Sabbath. You see? Because the last passage in Isaiah 66 is talking about Sabbath. You see that? And then, which is most important, the only, one, the only verse I really want to read is verse 7. That these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. I think we all can read the last part. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So this... It's the fulfillment, isn't it? You can see that, right? The end where you see Isaiah 66, where the nations will come to the holy mountain and pray. But I already told you, it's not really a geographical lo uh, locality, but talking about generally where the Holy Spirit is. Do you not know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, where the Spirit of the Lord is? God is there. His presence is here. So, if I then look at what we have studied for the last 66 chapters, if I can show you this next slide, you will see that in chapter 1 to 39, the highlight was really, that I think most of you can remember, is this prophecy or this foretelling. That this virgin or this woman, this young girl will be with child and you will call him Emmanuel. A son will be born. And he will be a sign. That's what Isaiah said. He will be a sign that because of this boy that will be born, God will save Judah. God will save Judah. If you remember, that is the main part. Then chapter 40 to 55, I am also fairly sure that you will remember that the highlight of this portion was about the work of this servant called the suffering servant or the sin-bearing servant. The verses are, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Then the last part, which is chapter 56, all the way to 66. Now you can see it's about this new heaven and new earth, but it's also about the gathering of the nations to God. So why am I showing this to you? Because I want you to see that this is the New Testament. It is about the birth of a boy and his work on the cross. And through him, the nations now come to know God. So Isaiah is like a roadmap for the New Testament apostles. So church, next slide, final, final two slides. How has studying this book, the book of Isaiah, helped you better understand the glory of God and the heart of this gospel story? You know, I, I, I don't know how you think about the glory of God. Okay, let's just imagine this. What do you most like to see when you go to heaven? Think about that. Because you think, oh, I, I, do you feel like the glory that you are looking for is your eternity? Oh, I have this new resurrection body. I'm so glorious. I'm like an angel. I feel so happy. Or you can see your friends, your relatives, or what? But I can tell you, the real, real glory is to see every nation and every tongue and every tribe standing before God 
and worshipping Him, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And that is the picture that Revelation shows us. A lamb that was slain and every tongue and every nation looking at the lamb. That the reason why we are here is because of this lamb that was slain. That is truly the glory of God. What is the heart of the gospel story? It's not, it is not, it is your salvation, my salvation, yes, no doubt. But it's not just an individual salvation. It is really to see that everyone is now welcome to join the banquet, the wedding banquet or the supper of the Lamb. To come. All are welcome. Every type, every kind of people, every race, every skin color. Come. Every language. Come. Before the Lord. That is the climax, the heart of God. And so I pray that our church, uh, all of us, we will have that kind of heart. That's why, it's, it's, that's why you see, if you... If you understand the gospel this way, you will become more accepting, more welcoming of people who are different from you. And that will change everything in your life, including ministry, serving. Who do I, who do I serve with? Oh, you will, you will not be thinking about, oh, I, I, I don't want to serve with this person. I, I, I don't want to be... Oh, you won't draw lines. You won't say, oh, this is my church. That is your church. You won't do that. Because the full glory of God is all are one in Christ Jesus. It's not looking out for your own interests, but for the interests of others. And I pray that that is what we will begin to see more and more as we study the Word. It's not even our individual power, like how powerful I can be as a Christian. Oh, my prayers are very powerful. i rather your love and your heart is so big then about you individually I am so powerful it's of no use Christ came and his love was for all for God so loved the world he gave his only son so my closing prayer for all of us today is who will be in the new Jerusalem the servants of God but what are the characteristics of God's servant they are people who are humble, they are contrite in their spirit, and they tremble at God's word. They study, they understand, and they try their best by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to live in obedience to God's word. These are God's servants. Amen. Are you blessed? You learn anything through these 16 sessions that we have? I'm so blessed because I've, I've you know, I've never studied it, it this way. But um, I'm just thankful that God allows me to read the word. Amen. Shall we just pray and I just ask the musicians to come and lead us to worship in response to God. Father, I just pray that you help us to all be humble before you, to love your word, to study it and understand it. Let it transform our lives. Father, bless our church and all the members and their families because you have chosen us to live in the new Jerusalem. You've chosen us through the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Continue, O oh Lord, to illuminate our minds that our love for others, our love for the nations, our love for people who are different, Lord, will increase more and more. Bless our church and our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come, let's just sing this song uh, as we worship the Lord in response to today's message on the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. Come, let's just worship Him together. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life And all my life you have been saved Goodness of God.
of God. I will sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. You know, church, God's promise to those who are His chosen ones in the New Jerusalem. He says, before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. I don't know if there's needs in our life, in our hearts, but it's to know that there is a master who cares for us, a Lord who has conquered death and we can trust in Him. We can depend on Him and call Him our Lord. He will provide our every need. He will comfort us when we go through challenging, down, difficult times. It's to know that you are not alone and you're not a, you're not a wanderer. You're not a vagabond. But you are a child of God. You have a family and God is your Father. Father, I just come before you today and pray, O oh God, that you will comfort our hearts. For those of us, O oh Lord, who are needing, O oh God, to hear your voice, needing an answer to our prayers, to just know that, Lord, we can trust in you and we need not be anxious about anything. But that all things, by prayer and supplication, we let our request be known to you. Hear our cry. Hear, hear our prayers, our petition before you. You have been good. You have always been good. Lord, we continue to put our hope and our trust in you. Truly, O oh Lord, before we call, you answer. And while we are yet speaking, you are already heard. So, be comforted, church. Be encouraged today knowing that you are God's people. You are His chosen servant of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord praise today. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Before I, we close this time in uh, Lord's Prayer and the benediction, I just want everyone to just be seated down because this weekend is Father's Day weekend and the children's church, they want to do something special. So I think the children are out there. So we guys invite the children to come in. Are they? No? Yeah, there they are. Okay, so basically, we have a gift for all the fathers here. I can tell you, I've seen the gift. You will be impressed and you will like it. It's a collector's item, okay? So... Okay, so all the father. Okay, the reason why I ask you to sit down is because some of our children are not here and, and then later the ushers will give it to you. So fathers, you just be patient. If you have not received a gift, uh, later I'll ask you to lift up your hands and the ushers will pass you one, okay? Hello? Are you going to do something? You be Bruce, take one for your dad. I, I can tell you, you will be impressed. No, no, I, I, I'm not joking. You open up, open up. No, no, you just open up. Open up, I see. I told you, right? <laughs> Impress it, right? Impressive, okay? I am shocked myself. John. John, you can take one back for Lubin or so. Yeah. Okay, now if you are a father here and you have not received one pen, you please uh, just lift up your hands. It's quite a nice gift to be honest. I just show you.
Okay, shall we just uh, ask the parents, fathers, can I just pray for you before we uh, dismiss today? Come, let's just pray for the fathers. I, I won't embarrass you. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you, as our chief shepherd, as our heavenly father, you watch over all the earthly fathers here. May you continue to strengthen us, strengthen them, Lord, with your grace, with good health, and you continue to bless them in their career and their family. Lord, we depend on your grace. Let us dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives. And let us enjoy the blessing of being a servant of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Happy Father's Day. And have a great uh, weekend with your loved ones. Shall we stand on our feet? Let's just close this time by praying the Lord's Prayer. And then I'll give you the benediction. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. You who are chosen servants and people of the new Jerusalem, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So actually, this weekend is also our youth uh, having their camp. So some of the parents and the youth are not here. Uh, just continue to keep them in prayer. Their camp will end by tomorrow. God bless you. Okay, see you next week. Uh, our guest speakers for two weekends. God bless. dream